And we're live. We have a fantastic guest today, Mike Dowd. Um, first of all, I'm Felix Levine, Gene Barella, Johnny A. Light, and our, uh, and our guest, as I just said, Michael Dowd. Thank you uh, for coming on the Johnny and Gene show. I know personally, I, I can't even, I know John and Gene are excited, but for myself, I'm super excited to, to have you here. Um, and uh, we're going to get into it because I know that you and John have uh, a lot of stories from, from back in the days. So first of all, thank you for being here. And, uh, you know, how's, uh, how's life been treating you the past couple of months? Thanks for having me. And a life is uh, <laughs> a bowl of cherries, I guess. No, I, I, I constantly have something going on. I can't keep track of my life sometimes. But the reality is I live a semi-normal uh, I guess I live a semi-normal life, you know, but I think this whole world today has changed. You know, everybody has interactions on a daily basis with people they don't even know. I mean, I mean, that's fair to say, right, between social media and whatnot. But um, I, I, I have issues I have to deal with like everybody else, you know. So, but as it's turned out, um, due to the things that we've done in our lives, uh, we've, <laughs> we, we've come across the pairings of some interesting characters in our, in our lifetime, and it's been... Uh, Every day is a wild ride, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> Every day is a wild ride. Now, can we curse on this show? Yes, as okay, because I don't want to. That's half my vocabulary, <laughs> and I don't want to. We don't want to limit you. I don't want to. Don't. I don't yeah. want to feel limited. <laughs> so I want to ask you, uh, because we got John right next to you. Do you remember the first time you you met John, uh, and what, or the fir- maybe the first time you you knew of John, what you knew of him, and then when you first met him, what your first kind of thoughts were? Okay, so what I knew of John was before I knew John. Okay, so um, and I and I, I know this can be a sensitive topic, but I knew of John through the Gotti crew people, and 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 I know this. You guys have been going back and forth with some kind of verbal war for a long time that I actually got dragged into. But I don't want to, that's a side note. But you know, so I knew of John, but never knew John. And then when I met John, uh, somehow he he reached out to me, or I reached out to him. He sort of moved. I think you saw the documentary, right? Yeah, yeah. We talked about seven, yeah, seven five. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was he loved the documentary, and he knew my character. He knew me, even though he didn't know me, because he had dealt with guys like me in in, in his life. And um, well, so, seven five especially. And especially seven five. <laughs> that's see, the worst see that's that's. The, that's what confuses me because I'm pissed off that I wasn't getting, paid, you know, getting <laughs> yeah. some of the some of the grease back then because he was running the streets when I was when I was there, you know, and that makes me a little upset, by the way. And why don't we discuss that later? Because <laughs> you may still have those connections or not. I don't know, but the reality is I, I missed out on mine, and I'm not I'm not too fucking happy about it. Hey, truth. Before you came on, we were talking about Frankie Burke, and uh, me and Frankie actually did a double homicide in the seven five, and guys used to ask us. Well, we just did a, a, sh- a short show on it uh, recently, and uh, they says, "How can that happen in the seven five and just leave a body there and the <clears throat> bodies?" And I says, We're "Well, we got to ask Mike." Down by the weeds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we only check the weeds now and then because yeah, yeah. You could, because if you went to the weeds, you were likely going to find a body. So, so that meant work, you know, and there was so much other work going on that they were already dead. So what can you possibly do? Yeah, people don't realize how busy the seven five was, especially back oh, in yeah. the day. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was fun though. Yeah. I have to say, you know, as busy as it was, it was. Every, you didn't want to miss a tour because something was going to happen that was really stimulating, exciting, and, and I don't mean too much pressure on someone's fucking neck. Like that's the, that's the, that's today's current stuff. Well, but just back then, it was shootings, it was rapes, it was robberies, it was murders, it was. Blood in the street. It was. It was amazing. It was. It was exciting. I'm glad we could bring you a lot of work there. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. But you guys actually just fucked it up because you know, those were old murders. By the time we got, there, they were done. <laughs> you know. Usually on a patrol situation, you arrive at the scene of a fresh kill, which nice. is well, fucking weird, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of killing over there. A lot of. <laughs> now, do you remember from your end what were you thinking when you had first heard of, of Mike Dowd, and then the first time that you met him? Uh, you think this guy's fucking crazy? No, I knew I knew a lot about Mike actually and his partner from the streets when I was younger actually, and then when he got jammed up. So, I knew the the history behind him, the story behind him. I always liked Mike prior to even meeting Mike. So when we met, we hit it off right away. And he's listen, he's a lot of fun. He's full of energy, and you know, outside of uh, what happened to both of us in crime and jails and. You know, I'm talking as a human being. He's he's really a, a great guy, good friend, uh, fun to hang out with, laugh all the time. And that's really about what life is for us now. I mean, like he said, it just changed. We got a wild ride constantly. It's just, at this point, it's in a good direction. Right. Do you yeah. ever... Uh... So when I met John initially, um, 
uh, f- physically met him, you know, personally, um, because he had reached out to me through social media. I, I, he sent me some message or whatnot. And then when I met him in person, it was like, because he's so handsome and he's got all this, this glow. He's got a 24-hour tan. You know, I, I don't know. You know, so now I, he caused me to buy a condo in Florida so that I can keep up with his tanning program. I don't know what the fuck he does. <laughs> you must have the bed in Cherry Hill. I don't know where you live anymore. But Convertible. <laughs> Convertible. <laughs> the hair blown back. And the, uh, but, you know, so when I first met him, it was like, you know, he's fucking jacked. You know, and, I, and I, I did a lot of time. I was jacked, you know. <laughs> but but I'm, almost, I'm almost 60 now, you know. Are oh, you? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be 60. You're a young guy. So. I'll be 60 in a little bit, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and you know, I come home, I was jacked and ripped. You know you know what that's like. You come out, you're working yeah. out. 20, <laughs> you know, all the, I had it down to 22 minutes, by the way, because that's enough. 22-minute <laughs> workout, done. Really? Yeah, it was done. A- and ripped. But anyway, so, but, but I look at he's handsome, he's glowing, he's got all this. And, 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 and I'm like, Johnny, to myself. What the fuck are you doing for a living right now? Like, who's hiring you? You got 28 murders or something. <laughs> I don't know how many. They were 20, 30, 40. What did they give you, 40 now? <laughs> I don't know. They, they changed that number. But you know what? He, he, so, but, 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 but Johnny was nice to me. And you know what? When you, when you go through the tragedy that, that many of us have had in our right. lives, you know, personally brought upon ourselves of our, own, of our own doing, when someone's nice to you for no ulterior motive, just because they understand, they empathy, sympathy, whatever kind of thing you want to call it, you know, <clears throat> agony. Um, but that's a connection that we all, when we go through that, that period of our life, like if someone's real to you and reaches out to you with, with, a, with a sense of touch, I mean, we're dealing with a lot of shit right now on the street. Like people got to have empathy for one another, you know, and some places sympathy or not, but you know, you got to understand one another. But when Johnny was so kind, to reach out to me, I didn't give a fuck what he did or who he did it to, because he wasn't treating me that way. And, and, and you know, we want real people to treat you like a real human being, and that's how Johnny treated me. So at that point, you know, it doesn't matter what he did yesterday or who he did or didn't do it to. And that's, that's, that was the way, I, 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 that's why I, I, you know, call it full in love, whatever. You, you know, have that bro thing with someone like that because right. of that feeling and because of that connection. So that's, Are there still people from, from you know, the, the past life that you've been able to stay, that you've stayed in touch with or still are friends with, either that you worked with uh, when you were in the, you know, in the police department? I mean, are there still, is there anyone that you feel like is a good friend that you still have from back then? Well, I, you know, that's a loose term, right? Because, you know, good friend. What's a good friend? It's, you know, the dollar in your pocket, right? And, and, and someone that, you know, when I have a question, are they going to answer the phone? I'm not asking them to come paint my house for me. I mean, you know, I, you know, like, like I'll call Johnny up. I, I, I'm negotiating some kind of a deal with the movie people or something <clears throat> of that nature. I'll give Johnny a call and see what his experience was on it. You know, some people don't have the time for you. You know, so who's your friend, mm-hmm. right? You know, the, the guy that was took you on a fishing trip once. You know, is he? Mike, we were just talking about that, right? Very yeah. before you stepped in, we were talking about how when you got your highs and lows and from whatever life, normal street life, uh, legitimate life, how people just ride the, the train to be your friend only when things are good. Only when things are good. And when things are bad, they don't know how to pick up the phone. And I think that's why we relate so well to each other is because uh, we kept it real with each other. No matter what, we're friends. Good, bad, and different. We're going to have our ups and downs. And I think a, a, a lot of people, especially when you come from the lives we came from, they just aren't sincere. And, and it's hard to get some sincere friends. And, and, and you hear the way I speak about Mike. Everybody knows that. You know a couple of my friends in Florida and mm-hmm, you know, different mm-hmm, things that, mm-hmm. he, that he socializes with and talks to. And, you know, it's hard to find real people. And especially today's day, it is. Do you, do you guys feel like, you know, I mean, you guys all had your different experiences that now in this, you know, next life, do you feel like it's harder to trust people? I mean, I'll start with you, Mike. Do you feel like, can you, do you feel like you're able to fully trust anyone these days? Well, no. No, but, but, but let me premise that by saying, you know, I, I'm more cautious about who I give information to because information will always be used against you, right? No matter what it is, you know, I like red cars and short skirts. So if I say that to someone, if there's a red car and a short skirt in the area, I, you know, they're going to use that against me. Sure. You, you, so any information that you give people can be used against you. You know, I used to think that that was a way of, like, connecting with someone. Yep. But oftentimes now it's like that's the first thing that's going to be put in your face or used against you. So you have to be cautious on that. But the reality is I've changed my approach. I, 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 I was a guy because I'm a reader. I read people the, the minute I meet them. And within three, four, five seconds, I've determined they'll never 
go down the road with this person other than, hey, how you doing? How's the weather? How's your kids? Have a right. nice day. On the other hand, I look at someone and, and I say, okay, this, you know, with the first few minutes, yeah. you know that this person is not there to hurt you or use something against you. And that's, that's how I sort of judge people today from my perspective because <clears throat> when you share information with people, you, you, you're going to get burned one way or another. And, and, and you got you to know people aren't... Yeah, aren't, I agree with him 100%. For you, you feel yeah, like- I agree with him 100%. He's right because once you tell somebody information about what you're pretty much known for, like you're saying, it gets used against you. That, that happened to me, same scenario with all the robberies and stuff like that where people would, would now would blame me for everything that was going on. When night eight, when you know half of them I wasn't even responsible for, but just because I'm known for that, now it's you know he's right with the information. It's now I did it all. Right. Everything's on me, you know. So it's for me, it's harder to trust people now because I had so many close people turn on me, you know. And and for you, John, do you feel like in this you know post jail and post that life that even even just having friends, you know, in general, it's uh, do you feel like you you have to watch what you say or that you you fear that they're going to use it against you at some point? Well, I think what Mike said and what Gene said is you know as, as you get older, you learn a little bit more about life. And we had the experience of life experience as as Mike was on the street as a cop, so he's seen everything. He was educated as a cop. He was also educated. As a criminal, he was educated in in the in jails. He's educated in in, in people in general, and I think our lives uh, actually made us pretty smart and pretty wise. And as you get older, you get a little wiser. So I think that we learn to you know, one thing we can do we're, we got a sixth sense as far as the street and reading people, just what Mike said, and and you know who's real and who's full of shit from being on the street and being with all the experience that we had. As we get older, we were Gene's age, you get a certain amount of experience. As you keep getting older, you start learning and, and you're deciphering through bullshit. And, you know, we've seen it all from drugs to bodies to good people to bad people to, you know, disloyal. You know, he was in on the force and whatever. He had a lot of disloyal uh, police officers that were his friend until he got jammed up. And then there was like, you know, see yeah, the guys were at my here. house one day partying with me. Oh, and the next day they. Oh, he could sell sand to an hour. Like these are the comments that are being made about guys that that you think got your back. You 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 baptized their kids with them and shit. You know, and all of a sudden it's uh, uh you know, he can sell ice to an Eskimo. Well, right. who the fuck says shit like that about right. about yeah. you? This is a guy that you had in your house, trusted around your family. I mean. <laughs> and how how has your mentality changed? You know, since since going to jail. I mean, what in this you know second kind of life? I mean, how. Well, so I've learned that uh, you really don't own your life, you know, like a lot of your life is like my life has been controlled by somebody other than me. So uh, and that goes back to like the information you share. So I try to not to put my life in control of somebody else's hands. So the more mistakes that I make or the more information I give you, I I lose control of my own life and destiny. So. My experience, I mean, I have hundreds of experiences, probably Johnny could tell you in prison and, you know, but um, for me, I, 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 I immediately cut people off more quickly. And, and I was, I'm not that guy. I'm a sociable, gregarious, you know, and that's how I learn, right? I share and I, I get information back. But for me, I've, I've made my world smaller if that's, a, if, you know, even though there's a social media world, I've made my personal world smaller. Hey, Brian, what the heck, Sean? Were you going to jail as a cop? Was it harder for you in there? Like, did you have more situations or did they have to, like, what was it like being in prison known as being So I'm going to break it down for you because I right. figured this situation would come up. So right. every day was, you felt like someone was going to come after you every day. Would that have you in population? Yeah. Wow. No, I chose the population. Wow. Yeah, they wanted okay. to keep me in isolation. I chose population. Wow. Like, ridiculous. Right. This is, you know. this is state? I, up, Nate, up, no, no, uh, no, no, no. This is federal. Okay. I started okay. out in MCC, New York. I was there for two years and I watched how it worked. Right. I watched how 88% of that federal prison was cooperating with the government. Right. And 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 you're telling me that I can't be in population with these fucking rats? I mean, no, you know, I, I mean, f- the, for real, you know. I love you, Mike. The way you talk, <laughs> it's true, though. He's right. Uh, you, you fucking guys, you, 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 you know, who the fuck you think you are? And you're telling me that I, I got to worry about walking a, a track with this guy in the same area? And then it gets into some other stuff. But the bottom line is that I felt that. If you're going to fucking be turning in, you know, all the paisan, right? They're all right. turning in their brother-in-law and their mother-in-law right. and their sister-in-law. And I'm like, 
Uh, and then in comes the Jamaicans and Pappy Mason's and my cellmate next to me. I'm like, okay, Pappy Mason just was accused of killing Eddie Byrne, the cop, right? right? And I got Jug Jughead, Mitch, whatever his name is. <laughs> I knew him all back then, right? He was the, the probation officer they killed. You know, there's right. all these guys next to me, and they're all crawling for an extra piece of chicken. I mean, you know, I mean, you, are you serious? Like, I got I to gotta be worried about these guys? You know? I mean, I can handle myself. Don't get me wrong. I'm a hu one human being, you know. Two right. guys, you're going to have a hard time no matter what, what neighborhood you're in. But the reality was, this is, I can't do another 14 years like this right. in a fucking box. And uh, so I, I told them I was going to kill myself. They didn't let me out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they let me out that day. Uh, you know, I mean, here I am. Why did I do this eight months ago? Well, I had, first of all, I had to get a feel for how it worked, you know, and how, how prison would be. And then when I realized that most of the guys in there, like, they would come to me, sneak talk to me. They always sneak talk to a cop because they still have that sense of that you're a cop. But a lot of people, even though they're gangster criminals, whatever, they still like talking to cops. Like it did, and I'm not saying they're sharing information with them. They just like to get a feel for what's going on because they know there's some balance usually. They know they got the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> they know there's some balance in a cop, you know? So like, like, like they bounce shit off you. I'm, gee, I'm sure you've done it in your, in your lifetime. I, I'm not putting you out there, but yes. I, mean, I know you did. You worked with them. Right. But, uh, but so, so I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about right now, but that's how it was for me going through prison. I, 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 and one of the things that came back to me, and I, I'm going to put some guys on the spot, is the, the wise guys treated me like shit in prison, not in the beginning, because they needed me. You know, in MCC New York, there's only like 42 white guys. Everybody else is black and Hispanic in there. And, you know, it's all clannish in prison, you know, even though most of the, the nicest guys were black and Spanish to me. And it turned out that the, 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 the wise guys that were cooking with the, uh, I don't want to throw names, but the Persico people and all, all those guys, they, they, they treated me wonderful in, in MCC, you know. But once I got to prison, they, they would turn their fucking head and wouldn't even know me, you know. And that was like, Wow. Again, you know, again, I'm getting disrespected, you know what I mean? And, and, and of course, I, I would never see, as being a cop in prison, you don't seek a friend. In prison, you know, everybody runs up to you, hands you stuff, you know, your first day off the bus, get this, get that, they load you up with shit, and then when you go back to commissary, you know, you repay everybody. You know what I got, Mike? I had probably had about 30 cops at work for me. And one of them I talked about a lot. He was a very good friend of mine. I moved two hours away. He moved next door to me, Phil Baroni. And I told you he was a decorated detective. He killed with me, sold drugs with me. He was my bookmaking partner. Everybody knows that. And I said, out of all the street guys that stayed with me, uh, and I had a falling out with this guy. He was probably the toughest guy at any gangster that had stayed with me. He took my back. He would shoot with me. He would, if I fought, he fought. Uh, the only problem I had with him was money. He was cheap as a bastard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 you tell him yeah. <laughs> but I got to tell you the truth. He didn't want to go to jail. I heard he was gonna he, he was gonna eat the gun. They stopped him. But as a tough guy, the guy was tough. And I had other cops that stayed with me. Were tough guys. So I go back to the same thing I always say. I judge a guy for the guy. I don't care. Mike's the same guy for me. If he has no uniform or he has a uniform, doesn't matter to me. I think the weak guys do what Mike's talking about in prisons. Because if you're a pretty strong guy, secure guy. You, you're going to be the first guy to stand up because you don't need the crowd to follow you. Right. So, yeah, and, you're right and, about that. And, right. and this is the, and he's a pretty tough guy. Anybody who watches anything or knows him personally, he's no slouch. So it's hard to go into a situation when you, you don't know the situation. It's like me walking into Brazilian penitentiary. <laughs> you got to feel your way around, right? You stick your foot in the pool a little bit and, and, right. and get an idea. Right. And then once, once you learn it, you know, he's from the street. He knows the street. Right. I think once you know the street, it, nothing changes no matter where the location is. I'll give you two experiences that make you both laugh and you'll, and you'll probably, you'll probably you'll, you'll get the gravity of what it was like, okay? So now I'm down. You know, once you're down a while, you start to have that little confidence in that little varnish where you know like it's like being a hairbag cop right oh this right. guy don't fuck with that cop you, you know look at his nightstick it's dragging on the floor his gun down by his ankle you know <laughs> you got a problem he's not the guy that's all well, uh, johnny <laughs> cracker or whatever but anyway so uh, i'm in I, I, I get transferred i'm like nine years down ten years down i call it uh, hunger strike somewhere whatever anyway and then i ended up uh, i like to say it because they'll change my fucking level if i have to go back to prison because i created some kind of hunger strike, but I didn't create it. I just helped organize it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I won't say that because I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but 
<laughs> anyway, so they transferred us to the brand new Brooklyn MDC, and I ended up getting transferred to McKean, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and, was yeah, and, and, and I ran into G uh, Joey uh, Gambino. Joe, yeah, yeah, wouldn't look me in the fucking eye one time, yeah. but he had me help get uh, my roommate at the time, Giovanni Zabano, because they were on trial, and that was his like rat, whatever, whatever guy was supposed to testify against him. He says, tell Giovanni, please don't fuck us. So I, you know, I'm the middleman relaying messages to this criminal organization, <laughs> right? And, 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 and they hung the jury because Giovanni wouldn't fucking sink him at the trial because I, we discussed the messaging back and forth. You know, right. I'm the fucking pigeon. And, uh, <clears throat> and I get to McKeon nine, ten years later, and he's like, Joe, Joey's got his head turned to the fucking ground. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, dude. Wow. I, just, I just fed your brother in the other prison I was in because his brother had the... the yeah, but you want to, I got to cut you. You want to hear a funny story, Mike? <laughs> I'll give you a funny story. Milano was the mayor of Camden. And it's on the opposite side of what he's saying now. Now, Milano was involved with everybody in Philadelphia. He's the, yeah. And he got an eight or nine year bid at McKeon. Well, I go to McKeon right after you're in McKeon. And he won't talk to me. So I go in the music room and I says, what are you stupid? Why won't you talk to me? He goes, oh, you guys got me all jammed up. I get eight years. Now I'm not involved in that case. I know guys are involved in the case. I go out there, you didn't need me. In here, you need me. I don't need nothing from you. Yeah. I'm just trying to help you out because I feel bad everybody's staying away from you. Right. I said, so I'm trying to do the right thing for you. When you need something, let me know. You don't got to lock yourself in the, in the music <laughs> room. Yeah. And then later on, he got friendly with me. But this is jail, man. This is just the way I talk about the street. And Gene, you know, because you came from this almost the same experience when you first came home now. You know, people want to grab onto you and gravitate. Like when Mike's movie came out, seven, seven, nine, uh, seven five. Five. Mm -hmm. I mean, whoever doesn't see it, you got to watch it. And it's got to get into a, a, a motion picture. It has to, because it's incredible. His life story is incredible. And I know the 7-5, and he knows. I know a lot of guys that work with me from the 7-5 that were dirty. And, you know, it's funny. Guys want to know you at certain places. Then they don't want to know you. So you got to have thick skin and right. say, you know, fuck it. Who doesn't right. want to know me? Like right. Well, right. Mike, I want to tell you, in Rikers Island, in the state, they probably wouldn't let you come out of protective custody, no matter what. Well, what they they, they wouldn't. No. The state, they would. Mark is on. They would never let the you state out, no matter would, what. But Rikers Island wouldn't. I know. Never. Yeah. Yeah. They, they would they not. They have a whole unit for that. They would have targeted you. Yeah. They have a whole unit, you, yeah, you, a whole unit for yeah. that. Though, so you're really mm -hmm. not locked down. Then. Right. So it's a different life. You know? Right. That. But but I, yeah, I know that. But in um, so so I get to McKean. I got to tell you this story. So I get to McKean and, and, and I'm there about three days. And this guy, big black guy, the size of this building, walks up. I'm taking a pee, and I just finished hitting the weight pile. And uh, I'm taking a pee, and this guy, uh, the, the sun goes, <laughs> he blocks out the fucking sun. He's so big, right? <laughs> and he goes, wrong ball, man. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. I'm here three days, I'm down nine, ten years, and I got somebody going to tell me I'm using the wrong ball. <laughs> All right? And I... Uh, how am I going to get past him <laughs> before he takes me? I don't know what's going to happen here, right? So I go, what? <laughs> I cut him in half with my... my right. He goes, he looks at me like, what the fuck's wrong with you? I go, what'd you say? He goes, you're bold, man. I go, I thought, I thought he said you got the wrong bowl, man. He said, you're bold. So I go, what do you mean by that now? I go, right. so I stay tough, right? <laughs> I'm sort of going, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> I go, w w what do you mean by that? He goes, you was that cop in New York City? I said, yeah. He goes, you don't give a fuck? I go, no. He goes, I'll just let you know, man. You're all right. You're all right here, you know? Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, thanks. For, you know, thanks for letting me know. I'm all right. I, I don't know. About a week or two, about three weeks later, some Irish guy named Mike from Boston. And you know the Boston guys are the toughest guys yeah, yeah, in tough. the joint. They're yeah. the toughest guys in the joint, straight up, because they're hard knuckle motherfuckers. Yeah. They don't care. All the Brink Struck guys, right? Yeah, all the Brink. He's a yeah. Brink Struck guy. Right. Shea he brothers. They yeah. were friends. He, with he me. wasn't. Yeah, I yeah. know him. Yeah. I, I, they were in with me in, yeah. initially. My yeah. friend yeah. was good. My friend they was really good. Guy mm -hmm. had the guy, mm -hmm. one of the guys. Yes, yeah, that's right. He's a good friend of mine. Actually, the guy was all fucked up. Yeah, yeah. He got twenty-eight years. Anyway, so. This guy's walking by, and, he's, and you can tell he's a squared away, straight guy. And it turns out he was former military, Marine guy, whatever. And I always see him looking at me, you know? And he just keeps walking. And then one day he says, Mike, like he catches me off, off guard somewhere. And I go, what's up? He goes, I, I, I got to tell you something. I go, well, he goes, I, I want to walk with you. But, and this is like, this is like, a, like, this is like a, 
I, I, I shouldn't say this, but he goes, this is what he said to me. He said, I've been down like four or five years, he said, and I watch you around here. You never stop doing what you're doing. You never hide. You're fucking always out there. You're a leader. You're in front of the pack. You know, you take the track, you do this. And so I said, yeah, and? He goes, I don't have the balls. He says, this is his words. I thought I was a man until I saw you. I'm like, what? He goes, I want to talk to you, but these fucking assholes here tell me to stay away from you. All the wise guys and all the fucking wannabes and whatnot tell me to stay away from you, don't talk to him. He was a cop. And yeah. uh, 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 like, I'm here for fucking shaking the world down, you know, <laughs> good police officer. But whatever, I mean, I'm not proud of it. But you, you know what it is, Mike? And, and again, they don't want to be known I, as walking with a cop. Well, I know all the Yeah, yeah. yeah we, even we, though I'm a fucking. That's it. Uh, yeah. I can't come out of prison and say I'm a cop. Still. Right. Can I, <laughs> that don't work. Can I get a job, maybe. <laughs> there's rules on the street and there's rules in jail. Mm -hmm. Right. But the same thing he's talking about, there was a pedophile priest that. Uh, he molested about eight kids. Well, he probably more, but he copped out to eight kids. Right, right. And uh, he's meeting different guys from the joint, and he's giving them newspapers. They're not supposed to talk to him, right? But they're meeting a, a pedophile, mm. and right. that's okay for them. Right. And I end up slapping the guy, Dude. and everybody's like, what are you slapping yeah. him? And they called me uh, PPP or something, Porn Police Patrol. <laughs> and I said, and now there's another guy that's there as a cop. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like everybody else. Right. I talk to him. I play bocce with him. I go, you guys fucking kidding me? The guy's a criminal. He's a gangster. Why wouldn't you talk to him? He, it, we, he was doing work for us out on the street. Yeah, it's okay he then. was helping. It was okay then. But you used yeah. to talk to a, a, a pedophile priest and take his newspaper. But the difference is some guys will stand on their own two feet. Right. And some guys won't. Right. And I could give a shit what anybody says anywhere I'm at. And everybody knows that about me. I'm so out there now the same way. Right. That. We're friends, whether we're out here or inside me, and you would be right. friends. Right. And a lot of your old guys that were involved with the 7 5 were my friends back then, and some of them are still my friends. But it doesn't matter because these guys change the rules as you go. And that's the problem. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, a week before I came in, I was working with some Columbos, okay? Yeah. <laughs> for real. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank God it stopped where it stopped. Right. You know, they're doing time for bodies. You know, they're probably not doing time now. None of them are really. You know, everybody's fucking gave the next guy up for the right. next for the next guy. But I, I'm working with the Colombo guys that are in the war. I don't even know about this war. I heard about it. Guy's got holes all over his body. Yeah. He goes, "We're at war. Who's we?" <laughs> I thought he was talking about Vietnam or something. Yeah. We're at war. I, I don't know. There was two factions, arenas, oh, yeah. arenas, and the yeah, actually three. <laughs> nah, well. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, see, I don't know. But all I know is they're at war, and I'm working with this guy, and he's trying to do all kinds of shit, and I'm like, okay. Arena, Arena got life, Joey Scopel got killed, killed yeah. and Persco just died. So that's the, Wild you know. Bill. Yeah. They killed Wild Bill. Yeah, yeah, Wild Bill. So, you know, yeah. during the, the, these in the early 90s, they had the war, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. in the yeah. middle yeah. of it. I, yeah, I right. didn't know, though. <laughs> I'm going to this guy's body shop, and he's like, oh, he's locking the gates. So I go, what's the matter? He goes, ah, the war broke out again. What war? What, 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 fucking the Gulf War? Yeah. I mean, yeah what's going on here? Crazy. He's actually one of the nicer guys, too, Joey Scope would have died. I mean, really, it was a nice guy. And uh, unfortunately, in that life, one of our friends was involved in that killing, Anthony Russo, who's a good friend of mine now. But that's just part of the life. This is just the way it goes. This treachery is unbelievable. And uh, just what Mike's hey, saying, or me and Gene hey, always talk about. Hey, Mike, the, uh, one of my friends was actually a bodyguard for Joey Scopo, and he said he used to walk around with grenades. <laughs> he says, come on, man. Yeah, They're walking into yeah. sit-downs with grenades. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I said, this I is don't just doubt crazy. it. These guys are crazy. <laughs> one of the guys spoke Vietnamese. One, one of the Colombo boys, like, his, his body, he spoke Vietnamese fluent. And he was like, he was like, he, he sit with his legs crossed and shit. And I'm looking at this freak, and 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 his, and the and the guy he worked for, I don't want to give his name up. He was a monster. He was the biggest guy you ever want to see in your life. All right, and and this is his bodyguard. He's half his size. Yeah. So I'm looking at this, I'm this guy and saying, well, he's your bodyguard. I don't fucking get it. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, well, he he does this real dirty work, you know, that I can't that I can't be doing, you know, because he don't give a fuck, you know. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> I, I, that's enough for me. No. <laughs> Do I need to know anything else about this record? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do you remember the first day that you got in jail? I mean, did you ever think that, you know, you were a cop, so you were used to putting people in jail. Did you ever yeah. think that, uh, do you feel invincible? In 
<laughs> well, well, I felt well, invincible me. before jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the minute before. <laughs> right. And then, but right when you step in, I mean, what's going on in your head? So there's two phases here. There's the first phase when I got arrested, uh, which was like quite the scene. What a movie scene that is! Holy flying fuck! But anyway, uh, and and um, so I get arrested, and then I get transported out to Riverhead, and I'm in Riverhead County Jail for a while, and I know I'm going to be either bailed out or I'm going to end up, you know, taking some, you know, decent little stupid plea and, and say I'm sorry to the world, which I, which I am and was, but still, you know, it's at this point in my life, I've paid my fucking dues, so I don't really get hung up on that shit anymore, but like, I'm ready to go away for a little skid bit and say, because uh, cause, cause people don't know the stories, is I knew that all they really wanted was me to quit. Right? So now you're going to sort of force me to quit. Okay, I'm going to quit. <laughs> right? So, so, so here I am getting ready to quit, right? I'm, okay, get me out on bail, let me quit. And, and, and then he's gonna go back. Like, that's how you think. You're so fucking, like your mind is so not in tune to really what's happening to you. That that's what I'm thinking. And then I get out on bail, and then I get set up by Kenny when we're out on bail on the wire and all this other shit that went on. And then when I hit the feds, and I'm driving in, and the, they got me in the back of the car, and they're driving me into the fucking federal building. And it says, the guy says to me, they're so slick, because these guys, you know, they had a little bit of that edge because they've been there before. So these detectives, they got me and they drive me in front of the federal building and they drive me past and says, United States of America versus you, they tell me. And I went, oh my God, this isn't good. <laughs> well, you got 15 years, right? Well, yeah, what 14. Was, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What he he got 14 years though. Yeah. Phil right. Baroni, now let me give you a comparison. Phil Baroni sold drugs with me, killed with me, bookmaker with me, did an armored van with me, part of the conspiracy. I did it, but he stayed home, but I had his badge. And he did <laughs> armed home invasions. He got three quarters dis uh, uh, pay, mm -hmm. right? Like retirement. Kenny, like Kenny. He got only 10 months in jail. And he became a multimillionaire with my money that I made him. Right. Now, yeah. now let's take a comparison, Mike. He didn't kill anybody. Right. He didn't do any uh, things that Phil did with me as far as murders and all this other stuff. And he got 15 years. So well, look at the disparity. So I didn't get 15. <laughs> well, you're I fucking sucked ass to get 15, okay? Yeah. Because they offered me on my first plea was 24 to 30 years. Oh, man. They that was, and, and I was sitting there, and the, the question goes back to what did it feel like when you walked into the, So now yeah. it's United States of America versus me. Oh, man. And the guy says this. We take over countries, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fuck. Mm. I'm not going to do too good against them, what right? What was your charge? What was your actual Racketeering, right. you know, RICO, right. uh, conspiracy to this they and that. They gave you a RICO? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sh I should have been uh, mobbed up right away, right? right? I got the RICO. Right? <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, I, I, they put they, they closed the cell on me. I'm in the hole, right? They put you in the hole right away when you first come in. Usually, especially guys like myself, cops. High profile. High profile. Yeah. yeah. I'm in the fucking hole, and I got guys crying on the other side. They're fucking. They keep leaving though. <laughs> These guys are leaving every day. Like, what the fuck are you going do to do to do? They come back like nine hours later. Probably. All fucking fed and fat and shit. They're going to the fucking prosecutor's office Profits. all day long, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there in my cell. When, they go, when do I go out? Like, mm -hmm. what, what's, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm, they, they close the door. I mean, they bring me food for a few weeks. And I'm like, when the fuck do I get out? Like, oh, what's my turn? Like, well, I'm, I'm, aren't I special? You guys are telling me how fucking special I am. You know, really? I'm all over the news. Every fucking day, the headlines of the news. Doubt this, doubt that. I mean, you know, my lawyer even commented, they're going to look for the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. You know, I, yeah. I was just one when they, the Lindbergh baby kid. Anyway, so, but you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, this is it for the rest of my fucking life, man. And it's like quiet, like this. You know, holy fuck. <laughs> and, you know, so that's how low you feel at that moment. Like, this is the rest of my life in this fucking cell. Like, I guess I can do. I, I guess I might be able to do this. Like, maybe. You know, we're gonna try it for a while. You know, and and and, and overcomes a well, enemy or Cho or a whirl or whatever. Rodriguez from the fucking Cali cartel, and he sees me fucking throwing my eggs out, and I fucking whatever that fucking white stuff is that looks like oatmeal, but it's not. Uh, grits. Well, grits. 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 Got, I'm not eating. <laughs> I this. grew up on grits. Yeah, yeah. I'm eating this. I'm not eating nothing. I'm, I'm, I can't eat. And finally, this, this guy comes over to me and he says to me, uh, you got to start eating stuff, man. <laughs> I go, this is fucking, he goes, that's what it is. 
He's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, thank God for guys with some wisdom that that that, that right. take, take a little guy. A little guy I'm like, oh, he's half my size, but you know, a baby like me coming in the joint and giving you a little bit of guidance here and there. Even though he tried to set me up with 500 kilo deal in the fucking hole, by the way. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I'm looking for help. And here's a guy, I got 500 kilos for you. Don't you worry. And we got a friend outside who's going to make a drop and you're going to make, you know, two and a half million dollars right now. And I'm like, this is great. I should have come to federal prison years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, they're fucking recording everything, trying to give you another charge while I'm sitting in the... It's just, it's, wow. You can't, people, you can't fucking believe this. This is wow. what happens, man. Yeah. This is what happens all day long. Everybody's trying to get a Rule 35. All day Everybody. long. Every, even in the witness units, they're trying to All do it. All day long. Yeah, it, it don't matter. It never stops. Right. Yeah. Holy shit. It's crazy. They call me. You gotta, I said, what do I do? I made a phone call. Uh, now I'm like, I'm facing 24 to 30 on a plea. I tell them, fuck you, trial. Now they're trying to set up a new set of charges. I mean, they, they never stop. Wow. The feds never stop. Yeah. There's nothing too small for them and nothing too big. They will never stop. I mean, you, you gotta set me up. I'm in the lowest point of my fucking life. Can you just give me a break? You know, you got me for this. Can you just leave me alone? I mean, it's insane what they'll do to you. Well, they might have thought you had information about guys that maybe you, maybe other crooked cops. You know what I mean? They thought you could have gave. That's what they usually do. You know? It, 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 that, that may have. They been, just want to keep the ball rolling. Oh, they never you know want it more. to end. Right? They exactly. Want, yeah. They like, like, like. Right. like they want to see if you know wanna, something about. They want to keep right. eating and keep mm -hmm. eating like Gavones. You know? Right. Uh, anyway, uh, you know. So much shit that happens. Do you think it was also because your trial was so public and was all over the news and everything that they wanted to make a big statement on, you know, getting these crooked cops and, you know, making a point about the NYPD? No. Really? No, they wanted it to end. Hmm. They wanted it to end with me. And that's why they made it so big about me. You know, if they could get a captain or a chief, what am I going to tell the fucking captain? Yeah, cap, I'm fucking making 8000 a week. I mean... Yeah. No, he's going to want half, right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way, like people think, you know what I mean? You have your little crew, and that's right. it, you know? And, and if somebody on the outside steps on you, you and your crew, either you take care of them or you put them in, and, and then you make more money with them. You, you use them for some kind of money-making operation. Wow. I had 12 guys lined up in uniform waiting to work for us. Wow. And they weren't on the job list in a year. I'm like, you guys got to go fuck yourselves, man. You better learn how to be a cop first if you want to go bad. You can't be a fucking bad cop the minute you start the job. It's ridiculous. And, and, and I don't promote that stuff. I, I, it's all wrong, you know. But I'm saying, if you really want to, you, you're going to be, you're 22 years old. You want to risk your life and your future by taking these risks that you see that we may, you don't even know what we're doing, by the way. They just have a clue. Well, it might have had something to do with the car you were driving. <laughs> what was what, what the, happened or, to or that the big Corvette? money that fell out? <laughs> what happened to that Corvette? Some wise guy took it out uh, <laughs> of the keys. <laughs> <laughs> now I was uh, when I Wall was... State. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. I paid my fucking debt on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other day I was watching. I was telling them I was watching the Seven Five again. Um, and my girlfriend, she told me she was like, "He looks so calm at that trial." And I've never seen someone be so honest. What's going on in your? I mean, you knew so many cameras. The world was watching. And were you? Did you go in there like, yeah? I'll just I'll tell him exactly as it is. What's going on in your head? Well, first of all, you you can't lie in that fucking room because they could bring you a new charge. That's number one. And, and, and why lie? I mean, at this point, I was like throwing up. You know, uh, one of the, uh, Mary Murphy, I think, from News 11 or well, at that time or two, or whatever the hell she was, she used one of these words, which, which I can't even, and I know the word implicitly, but I can't repeat it right now. And I went, and then she like, she, she um, defined it. It's like, it's like, 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 you, like you were regurgitating, you know? And, and uh, so I looked at her and I said, yeah. That's exactly what it was like. So, so, and I forget the word right now, but it, it escapes me. Uh, it's quite an educated word. One of my, one of my uh, 500 words of power in that book that you read yeah, when you're right. in prison. Sure. You know, we five, all read it. Yeah, you know, 500 words of power. Oh, my you come out with a vocabulary. Like, yeah. you don't know, who, now who do I speak to? <laughs> no one that I know could understand any of these 500 <laughs> words. But um, so, so the gravity of that was like, I was in a hole for fucking nine months, right? <laughs> Yeah. And then I was in in, in, a, uh, in a cell with a bunch of uh, next to all the half these wise guys, uh, Masterano, Master Frankie, Frank Masterano. Does that make a Masterano? Masterano. There's a Masterano. I don't know a Master. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he he had seven bodies, but he 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 was like the nicest guy in the world. He knocked the guy out right in front of me because the guy gave him a hard time over the phone. Boom, plastered him. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah, Ringo. Uh, but 
but I, I mean, so so I come out of that environment and I'm in front of this like like I'm, I feel like I'm on vacation. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been just in the I've been, right. I've, been, I've been locked up for almost two years or not, whatever it was. I think that about fourteen months by the time I got in front of the, in front of that panel, and I had already gone through testimony with the people that were on the panel. I didn't know they were going to make. We look like a jackass, which, by the way, that's what they do. <laughs> you know, like someone might have wanted to give me a heads up on that, you know. So, Mr. Dowd, when you did this, I'm like, <laughs> bitch, you were trying to suck my dick. I mean, I mean, you were all over my shit, and, and, and now you're fucking talking to me like, like, like I stole your personal lunch money? I mean, for Christ's sakes, you know, you leave me. Anyway, you, you, I couldn't believe the, the way they, because it's all about them. Right, and I don't know this. I think it's all about me. Right, <laughs> that's how childish we can be. But you know, for me, it was it was it was a break to come out of a cell, you know. And they walk me. I got a suit and tie on, like a gentleman, like a gentleman. Finally, again, you know. Well, maybe I'm not quite a gentleman, but you know, a decent. I, I look like a gentleman. <laughs> did you? Uh, I mean, you talked about I think a little earlier, maybe about the the highs and lows in, in prison, but. Did you ever have a, a really low point? I mean, I've talked to, to these two individually about um, those moments, and I don't know if you can recall hmm. a time that you felt like you were at your lowest low, that there was absolutely zero hope. So, um, I guess, you know, it, it, it ebbs and flows, but there was a point where I had, uh, so this, people may have heard this, or, 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 I don't know if John and Johnny know is aware of this, but I had earned a year off of my sentence wow. for taking the, the drug program. Anyway, long story short, without getting out in the weeds with the story because it can get convoluted, I, I end up putting in for a transfer. Yeah, that's another reason, whatever. <laughs> anyway, another story. But so I put in for a transfer, and I end up. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a snippet. So the unit manager doesn't like me because I do paperwork. Right. And don't, I never did paperwork in the street as a cop, right, but I'm imagine. a paperwork guy. Right, I, I, I keep everybody on their fucking P's and Q's. Well, people that don't know what paperwork yeah. is, it's when you're writing up counselors and cops and yeah. different right. things right. For, for whatever they're doing wrong to you. They take it seriously, yeah. Washington, though, when you send them. They take them seriously. So, I, so. by the time I get to Washington with all right. my complaints, you know, uh, now everybody's mad, right? Uh, well, you didn't do this for the guy, whatever. So, long story short, it took me four years of paperwork to get them to take a year off of my sentence that I had earned. But th it was about a, a, having a weapon in your possession doing any crime made you like violent for the purposes of the drug program. You didn't qualify for the year off. But that was an arbitrary rule put in place by the Bureau of Prisons. So I had to challenge them for four years. And then when I finally win, they refused to change my sentence date. Another fucking year of paperwork to get them to change my sentence date. And finally, the unit manager says to me, after I put in for my presidential commutation of my sentence, because everybody's entitled to do so. That's what I, I just do what I'm entitled to. He goes, who the fuck do you think you are? You deserve a commutation. I says, I came to prison. I've done everything you've asked me to do. I volunteered for every program. I'm on your suicide watch, which I saved two people trying to kill themselves. For real. I said... I mean, it's in the newspaper, one of them. So there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I ran your drug and alcohol program for five years. I was a peer counselor. What, I mean, what more could I do? Right. Uh, stop bank robberies from the joint? I don't know what more do you want. I've done everything that you could do in prison, essentially, to be considered for anything, uh, you know, rehabilitative, whatever. And uh, you motherfucker, you make us do all this paperwork all the time. Do you think you're special? I said, no, I just think I'm regular. And anybody who's done what I've done, you know, because I'm supposed to be camp eligible, like in like a year, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 years later, I'm still in the fucking medium high the whole time, which, you know, camps give you a little more leeway, a little more room to, to, to be semi-human, you know? So I knew it was a tough battle all the way. Now this guy's telling me this. I said, I said, he's a Mexican guy. So, you know, Mexican guys, they're a little, they think they're tough, you know, you know and, and they are, they're good boxes, right? Yeah, I mean, they're great, them. they're great boxes, many of them, you know, they, they can fucking hit like me. So I said to him, you, you want, you want to hit me, don't you? Cause you could see the fucking, I mean, I'm, I can read people. <laughs> you want to hit me, don't you? He's just grinning at me. I go, 
take your best shot. <laughs> you and me, I'll close the door. We'll have some fun. I said, I'm sure you can fight. You're a Mexican. You know, like, okay, bias, racially bullshit, whatever. The point is, if, if he's anything, and if he's a Mexican guy, he, he, you know, he likes to throw his hands around a little bit. I could tell he wanted to hit me. And uh, it was like boiling inside him. I said, look, it won't go anywhere. You and me, we'll just do it, you know. Right. So he goes, I got a surprise for you. I said, oh, really? So, P.S., they transfer me. He's part of my transfer team. Right. They send me to Devons, Massachusetts, which is close to the yeah, home, I know right? Devons. Fort Devons. That's right. where I run into jo jo Johnny Gambino with the, with the paralyzation right. guy. Anyway, so they send me there, and when they send me there, I lose the year off. Of my, so it gets added back to my sentence. So you talk about, I mean... They put me on tours, whatever kind of... They put me on all kinds of fucking anti-depressant drugs and shit and put me to sleep for hours at a time. Because <laughs> Dorsey, Dorsey. I, I was... Yeah, whatever they put you I don't know. I was, I was going to climb the fence. Like as I said, my release date was 2003. And they changed it to 2004 because when I transferred wow. from this judicial circuit, the 11th, where I won my case, the first circuit didn't have the same rulings in place. So he's like... One of the counselors came up to me and says... Dad, are you sure you want to get transferred? Like, instead of saying, you're going to lose the year off, you're fucked. Because there may be some issues with your thing. I said, issues? What issues? I can handle all issues, right? I get there. I'm there about two weeks. They call me in, these two little psychologist ladies. You know, cute. You know, oh, wow. I'm, I'm just like my fucking lucky day in prison, you know. <laughs> I got two attractive young women around me. Oh, what the fuck? I'm, I'm still a man. And uh, we got good news and bad. <laughs> Well, why don't we start with the, well, let's start with the bad. You lost your year off <laughs> when you transferred from fucking Florida to, uh, to, to, to Massachusetts. I went, like, the floor w would not hold me. I was so shot. Right. I was, so she turns around and says to me, do you want me to call an ambulance for you? Like, like, that's, she saw, I was like, I was physically, I was in some kind of a fucking state of 